All right, so we are here with Officer Keith Linton, who is the founder of Boys to Gentlemen in the community of Watts, LA originally, but has now expanded to many, many schools. Uh, what, did you, what did we say, about 26 schools, Officer? Yeah, as of uh, last year and the beginning of this year, about 26, 27 schools. Um, and you are actually, you're a former officer of the LAPD. And I kind of just wanted to start by asking you uh, how that came about. Uh, I know I, I know you grew up in New York, um, so I just wanted to ask how you ended up in the LAPD. Um, well, I guess it's a funny story. Uh, I used to work um, for a school district, and I had a buddy who wanted to be a police officer. And at the time, he, he wanted me to go to the academy to take the test with him. And I was very strong in saying, I, I hate law enforcement. Um, I, I'm not effing with the cops. I, I'm not going to take any tests. And um, he forced me to go take the test with him. And so we get to the academy and, you know, all I'm thinking about is really the honest is Rodney King and racism. And, and I get to the academy and I see black, Mexican, I see detectives, I see Metro, I see SWAT, I see all different facets of LAPD that I didn't know. Um, all I knew was patrol, white officers with a baton. And uh, so slowly I took, I took the test, he took the test, um, got into the backgrounds. My background took two years because I had poor credit. I had a, a misdemeanor warrant for a traffic ticket. Um, basically I was that young man living in an underserved community trying to make it. And um, at the time they had Bill Bratton, who used to be the police chief of New York. And his directive was to hire as many people as we could and to diversify LAPD a little bit more. So my, my background took two years. The friend who was taking it, he failed the background. I went up going farther. So I made it into the academy. And, um, I, you know, I, I think when I started, um, I applied in uh, 2002, and when I applied, I was like, you know, maybe this would be, we all talk about protesting, but I thought maybe this could be my silent protest. Maybe I can get in to the system and have them see a young black man that was raised all over, but in the projects, who has tattoos. Maybe I can show these officers that I too can read a, a street sign, that I know how to work a computer, that I'm literate, that I know how to de-escalate situations, that I can apply the law fairly. And maybe if I get in and I'm an officer and these other officers that maybe have biases, maybe if they're in the car with me, maybe the next time they pull over a young brother that looks like me, maybe have some swag, maybe got some earrings, some tattoos, maybe they'll think about, hey, you know, we got a, a black dude that comes to our roll call He's been, he's been promoted three or four times and all young black males are not on parole. All young black males are not on probation. All black males that got tattoos are not bad cool, bad, bad dudes. Some black men that maybe sag their pants just a little bit because they got a little swag and style, maybe they're not all thugs because we work with one that when he comes into roll call, we have to ask him, is, are you one of us? Because is he working undercover? So maybe, because we're in the car, with, I was thinking, well, maybe if they're in the car with me, the next time I'm not at work and they get out of the car, maybe they'll look at that young black man and think, wait a minute, okay, we, we work with also letting, let's give this brother a chance. And if they give a brother a chance, that could be, I'm sorry to say, but that could be life or death situation. Because I, I learned as an officer that, um, you know, they I, and I, I get this from my sons because they watch Avengers and Spider-Man and all that. And I think one of the things it says is with power comes uh, great responsibility. That's like from, I, my sons teach me, it's from Avengers. And uh, and it's so true with officers. And I, I don't think they understand that like, and I understood that because of where I grew up. So if I pulled you over and you didn't have a license, I knew I had the power to explain to you why I pulled you over but to also save your life because here in Watts, if I pull you over in, in Jordan Downs and you have to go get your car out the pound by Nickerson Gardens or a Bloods, 
and you here and you live in Jordan Downs, you might not even be a, a Grape Street, but because you live in Jordan Downs, they may say, oh, you're affiliated with Grape. So as an officer, what if I take your car and I know that the politics, so now I know you're dealing with your wife or your girlfriend or your baby moms and the job that in underserved communities, I'm sorry, sometimes the jobs that we have don't pay sick time. So now you're gonna take the bus to work and, and maybe see another gang member? No. Are you gonna go get your car in another gang neighborhood? No. So what happens to that car? Either you lose it or you wind up getting all these fees. And if I know you live in the housing developments and rent's like two or $300, I should know that, that you're not gonna be able to, if you choose between paying rent, buying groceries or getting your car, you can't do all three. So in a way, even though it's his fault, I have the power to kind of save his life because I know it's tough times. So if I give him that ticket and then pound his car, that's probably gonna turn into maybe a warrant, maybe more money for him. So what I used to do is LAPD, you can have spirit of the law, where I'm explaining to you guys right now what you did wrong, and then leather to where, no, Dave, you're getting this ticket, show up to court this day. And so in Watts, what I did for a couple of years is I applied spirit of the law. Now, of course, if you committed a felony, domestic violence, uh, um, a big felony, one grade uh, dope, caper or something like that, or a stolen car and you're in it, yeah, you'd have to go to jail. But in the situation where I can explain it to you, I would do that. And I wouldn't do it with my hand on my gun. I'll pull you out the car. I wouldn't sit you on the curb. I would treat you with respect and talk to you about, hey, I wouldn't even talk about the ticket. I'll talk to you about, did you watch the Lakers game last night? And then we'll get around to the ticket and i say, hey, nice to meet you. I'm also lit. I'm going to be in here. And then he would know, like, you know what? He could have took my car. He could have cost me higher insurance rates. My death could have, my, 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 my life could have been on the line because I got to go to this community. But this is an officer. He's cool. And so I did that for a couple of years. And after I did that, then I was able to walk in Jordan Downs by myself and start programming because they knew I wasn't there to just arrest people. They knew I was there to try to bridge that gap. And I... And I was able to do that because I understood where they came from. I had cousins that were locked up. I, you know, I went black and I, and I was telling them, I said, before I was an officer, I was a black man. And even when I was an officer, I would remind them, like, I, I'm in the struggle with you too. I'm in this system. So you can see there's brothers that look like you that's willing to help and that, do, that know how to apply the law. And I'm hoping that these other officers, even from LAPD, from Chicago, they see me. Maybe it can trigger in their mind, like, maybe that inherent bias I have, maybe it's not all true for all black men, all black women. So um, I know that's a long story, but um, I, I joined LAPD for like my, my silent protest. And um, I, I realized when I got in that how they applied the law, what reasonable suspicion was, what probable cause was, uh, the different units you could work. And when I got in, people thought because I'm 6'2", you know, 250, a big dude, they thought, oh, you're going to be SWAT? And I was like, no, nah, I want to work with kids. And when you when you work in the hardest division in LAPD, Southeast Division, which is the busiest division LAPD has, and you come and saying, hey, no, I don't want to do SWAT, I want to work with kids, they kind of like, like, you're a little punk, like, what, you, what, what are you talking about? And so... I think I wanted to respect the officers because I, I didn't care what they thought. I just knew that because in New York, how officers treated me and gave me a little chance, I figured if 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 I could do the same thing for these young brothers in the in the in, the, in their hood, instead of giving out booking numbers and booking numbers and booking numbers, what if they could see me and I could start giving them hope? So what if they could look at an officer and say, he could have given me a booking number. But damn, he, he came, he saw me with a red cup. He didn't arrest me. He didn't say I was loitering. He understood that in the projects is hot. He's out here. He's protecting us. And so we want to come out, not to loiter, but because now we get to get out this hot house and we feel protected. And how about he's helping my son in school with his math, with his English, with confidence building, with investing, how to tie a tie. 
And so, um, you know, I left LAPD in 2015. And at the time I left, I probably left around 160 grand on the table with benefits included. And I was homeless for about three months. But I just knew that um, I was always preaching about living your dream. And LAPD wasn't my dream. It, it was a career I had to where I knew if, if as long as I didn't do anything stupid, I had a career for 30 years and I had to take care of my family. Um, but it wasn't my dream. And I felt like a hypocrite. I felt like I was talking to kids and families about living your dream and I wasn't living my dream. And, and my dream was always to be like a community activist, uh, giving people their voice who were scared to voice their opinion and helping kids that were like me who suffered from PTSD, who, who needed some help with their mental health, who, who needed to feel like because they were different, they weren't included, but they wanted to feel included. They didn't know how. That, that was me as a kid. I had a speech impediment uh, because of the violence I saw growing up. I had a little bit, a little bit of PTSD, everything that a, a kid in an underserved community goes through that we don't acknowledge. We acknowledge it for our vets, but we don't acknowledge the PTSD they're going through now. Just, you know, just recently seeing a black man with his, his a knee pain being put on his neck for nine minutes. Kids were watching that. And kids are thinking, is it bad? Is it good? I don't know. This dude's on, uh, he, he got bailed out. So someone over there raised a million dollars for him to get bailed out and a death was televised on TV, he's out. And these, these black and brown boys are watching that saying, my life, I guess my life doesn't matter because this dude committed murder all of a sudden and he's out. So, and this is what we're going through in America. A lot of kids are done with PTSD. And um, I decided, you know, let me leave LAPD and without the, without the politics of it all, let me just start a nonprofit and let me go into all these schools, the lowest perform, not the easiest schools, but the lowest performing schools. Instead of yelling at these kids and saying, you're suspended, you're doing this. How about we get them in a circle and do like a harm circle and get down to the level so we can understand that the reason he might be cursing you out, the reason he might be falling asleep is because maybe he didn't eat a meal last night. Maybe he slept in the tub last night because they were shooting. And he didn't get any sleep. Maybe that's not in his life because a high incarceration rates where 95% of my, percent of my young men, their dad's not at home. So maybe all these issues, and then maybe for him to even walk to school, sometimes he has to run to school. So now you have a kid who didn't eat, who didn't sleep, who has to run to school. And in the state of California, if you're in third and fourth grade, only 25% of our black and brown boys can pass math or reading. So you have those five things. And then you get into a class and you expect these kids to just be okay and if you don't know all that as a teacher then as soon as let's say I have a student named Dave as soon as Dave is saying ah, bah, 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 you send him out of class you send him home where, where are you sending him home to you sending him home to the hood to the streets to recruit him and I knew that and so I said no let's keep him in school let me come into your classroom let me work with these kids and um that's how be the G was for yeah man that's really awesome and like super in inspiring um, we've talked a bunch before, and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to getting involved. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I think I'm going to start with this one because uh, it's a question that uh, most African Americans have, and um, we always ask it to lawyers, you know, but I feel like it's definitely a great question to ask a person that used to be a police officer. Um, when we are in compromised situations, you know, uh, let's say I get pulled over, whatever, and I, it's actually happened to me quite a few times, but, you know, like, pulled out of the car, profiled, do you have any weapons, like, anyone who knows me knows that, like, I would never, like, have any weapons or be any type of threatening <laughs> uh, human being, you know, but I have been uh, treated that way just because of the way that I look, so, um, what is your advice as far as like how to handle that situation? Like lawyers always tell us, you know, you have to know your rights and like say this and that, but from someone that is on the other side, you know, um, how do you think it is best for us to like deescalate uh, that type of situation? 
Um, it, you know, that it's tough. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, we've had our, our talks where we've talked in our Wednesday Zoom meeting sometime, and it, it really pains me, even as a former officer, to see that. Um, what I say is, because I was pulled over the other day, and because I don't look like an officer anymore because I have my beard and sometimes I wear my earrings and when I don't have a long sleeve, you see all these tattoos. So even myself, a former officer, since I've been retired, I probably got pulled over about 50 times. And Is that one five or five zero? Five zero. Fifty in five years. Yes. Wow. And I'm a former officer. So I have a a, a dark uh, tenant vehicle and even me knowing my rights I get a little nervous because I'm like and I, I'm sorry to say but in, in my mind I'm like I hope I'm able to get out the words that I'm a former officer and the reason why I went over tenants because I have gear in here still and I don't want people looking in my car before they prone me out and I'm sorry it's but as a black man, and I don't think anyone can understand, as a black man and seeing all the stuff on TV and seeing a guy, an officer say, hey, let me see your, your ID that says you can carry a concealed weapon. And he, and he gets killed in front of his baby and his mother. Uh, I can't think of the guy's name right now, but that happened a, a year ago, a couple years ago. So I'm always thinking that, like, what was that they called? don't know who I am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? Carl, what did you say? No, no, that's Philippe uh, Castillo. It was, yes. He got shot holding his own with his with his right to carry. Right. And all he was doing was like this. I'm going to show you my eye. And boom. And his little baby is consoling the mother. And I'm thinking, they don't know I'm also Linton. So please don't let that happen to me. And that shouldn't even be in my mind. And I'm a former officer. So how much worse for Sly? For Carl, for Nikki, that you have no idea what law enforcement does, and so I always tell people like it's it, it, it's it's a thin line because Nikki could be real calm and be like, "Yes, officer, here's my ID and this and that," but what if the other officer is just pissed off? Like I've seen on some of these news channels to where, or I've seen it to where the guy's real calm. Like Castile was very calm. Yes, officer. I have a concealed. Let me see your, your your ID. Okay, boom. What did he do wrong? He was very. He wasn't belligerent. And and the officer was like this. And so he had the baby, and the wife was next to him. So, so it's like I could tell you. Let me sneak in here. Um. So so. A lot of this just. You have you seen up close that kind of irrational fear from a, a white officer towards people of color? That's a good question. Uh, when I worked at Southeast Division and I did traffic stops and I had a white officer, no, I did not. I did not. But what I did see is when we got to the car and I would ask the person, and my gun wouldn't be out, and I would ask a person for the license registration, I could see that they were nervous because as an officer, I would look right here and I would see this going all over the place. And then it meant to me like you're guilty. It meant to me like, let me calm you down. Cause I get it. I get it. I understand. You don't know what's going on. And so I see some of us might look at that and see this popping out and say, oh, he's guilty. Something going on. And, and they heightened it and they escalated to like, get out the car. And I would say, brother, this is cool. Yo, do you have your license and registration? Don't, don't worry about it. You cool. Let me just, you know, you ran that light. Why'd you run the light? You let me just talk to you. Because I would think, I got a partner. I got a, a walkie-talkie to where I can call it airship. I don't need to escalate the situation. I'm under control. I got all the training in the world. The training probably is a, some, some element of it, right? I mean, <laughs> officers who are that reactionary might be either just ill-fit their personality to 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 be a uniformed officer from the beginning and furthermore may not have been properly trained or just not taken in the training. It sounds like you were very fortunate to be, you know, in a, in a tight knit group of officers who 
you you help to educate but you know we do we see so so many examples of what of uh you know what carl was asking about you know yeah and, and you know what and not to cut you up there but you know what like lapd the division because we got 21 divisions so i can't speak for every division within lapd but southeast division where i worked um my the training i received was you know i'm probably biased to it but I felt like it was the best in the world. My tactics, um, but, but with all the training, the best training I had was who I was and where I grew up and my mother and my father and and and, and, and the common sense. I think people forget. Sometimes common sense is better than a bachelor's or doctorate's um, common sense and then just inherently how I was raised to treat people with respect. And I think that like in Kentucky and all these other cities, I can't speak on their, their training because I see shootings that, as a former officer, I, I just don't understand. But um, I think, you know, we talked about, I, I think Trump was saying that it's racist to, to, to have cultural diversity training. Um, and I think, for me, I don't need cultural diversity training, but I think in law enforcement, there needs to be some cultural training so that they understand not just my culture, but maybe the Hispanic culture, the Indian culture, the Asian culture. It, it only makes sense. You can't just understand your culture and apply the law based on your culture because then, yeah, I'm always going to be guilty. I'm always going to be up to the wrong thing. It only makes sense that not just have culture diversity from black and brown, but all ethnicities that you're going to serve. It only makes you a better officer. And I think when they talk about defunding, uh, that doesn't make sense to me, but you can reallocate a lot of money to do these kind of trainings. You can reallocate a lot of money to do maybe the first ever citizen police officer academy together so we can start understanding each other. You can do a lot of stuff with allocating money uh, that might be better than defunding some police. Now, some of the police departments that they're just off the chain, then maybe they need to be breaking up. But I'm not, I, I'm not cool with the idea of dismantling police departments because, listen, uh, I have family that still live in the housing developments and they do not want to see police defunded. They want to see more police on these streets because it's off the chain right now. But they want to see good officers. Yeah. Now, now, when you um, you said that you felt like the LA police, LA, your training was really good. In, in um, terms of numbers, does LA have, do they have less of these senseless shootings than other t than other places you know what um i, I think in the last couple of years and then I, and and now i don't know the inside because i've been out of law enforcement for five years uh, but when i was an officer we had a couple of police shootings um but we didn't have you know because that's is in the area that i worked at in la the police shootings are going to happen uh, because you're dealing with a lot, uh, you're dealing with a lot of citizens. But yeah, we had, I don't know the numbers, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they had a lot of police shootings and what, and what law enforcement does around the world is sometimes before it can make the media, let's settle. Let's pay them all this money so that we don't have to go to court. And if we don't go to court, then there's no cameras. And I'm talking about what happened. If you just say, hey, Carl, yo, we kind of messed up. Um, this officer can get some training. Here's a couple million. And Carl says, okay, then the case closed. Right? And I, and I think even it's sad because even with Brianna Taylor, I, I get it. You know, they got 12 mil. But that's not justice. You know, and, and I, I know that, especially during the pandemic, we're not, we, we're not millionaires. So someone throws millions of dollars, we might take it, but in the future, we're gonna have to start saying, and excuse my language, fuck your money. Let's go to court. He needs to, you know, you give me $12 million and he's getting bailed out the next day and I can't kiss my daughter on the cheek and she didn't do anything wrong. No, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be cool with giving your money now and not having, and, and just being quiet. So get your money. How about we go to court and then after he's convicted and now I'm coming for your money. I was wondering, um... <clears throat> because you have obviously, you know, 
all the officers have the same training, right? You all go through the same <clears throat> police academy and and you have the benefit, we could say, of coming from the community that you're actually policing. So, and, and then being able to draw these connections between like, like, as you were saying, like, oh, okay, well, you know what? He's speeding because he's going through like a neighborhood he's not supposed to be in. And he's trying not to get in trouble or, and just being able to put those things together and like understand what's going on. And like, you obviously get like able to influence like people directly around you. But like, I don't know, I guess in my mind, like if I see like everything that's going on, riots in the streets, I'm a police officer. I'm just like, all right, well, if, if I was like, towing that line a little bit, I'd be like, well, maybe like I should stop or maybe I should, I should straighten up my act or consider it. But it, it seems like these things continue to persist. And I'm just wondering, I'm like, cause not everybody's going to have like your point of view of having grown up in that. But like, how, how does it actually like, how does it change like from within the department? And, and then also like what, like what needs to happen like outside of the department to actually get people to start asking themselves these kind of questions. And, and like, I guess what is it called? Critical policing. Like actually like thinking about what's happening instead of just blindly following orders or, or going through the motions of, of pulling people over and, and reaching quotas and tickets like that. Like how, how, how do you think we, we could possibly come to something like that? You know, um, yeah, that's a good question. Sly. And I think it's going to take, I think it's going to take years. I, I think it's going to, and I think it starts from, you know, we're talking about voting on November 3rd and that's great, but, but it's more about, what about your mid-elections? What about the elections that no one talks about on TV? What about knowing what your governor's doing? So then you can go down the line and know, okay, who's under your governor? Okay, who's in your council? Okay. Judges. Okay, who hires the chief? Okay. What is that chief about? Is that chief about community policing? Is he about law enforcement and everyone's guilty? Oh, you don't need him. So as a people, instead of just coming out for November 3rd, go to your council members, go to see who your local chief is and say, okay, we want this chief out or we want this chief in. And then after that chief, it goes down to your deputy chiefs. Then it goes down to your captains and then it goes down to your sergeants, your lieutenants, and then it goes down to your officers. And I think, it's a long process, but I think it has to start from the top, from the police chief to the deputy chief, to your lieutenant, to your lieutenant one, to your captain, to your sergeants. And, and these officers like myself in the street level have to see the examples from the top brass that things are changing because officers can change. Like I was an officer that tried to do my best, but the best examples will come from the top. And so I think it's going to take years, but I think it takes years. But I think the most important thing is that we're talking about voting, which is great, but it's more than just about November the 3rd. I don't think people understand that Trump has put almost 200 judges in places. Who stands in front of those judges? And what are those judges about? Are they about law enforcement? So when they see Sly and you're standing there with just a little ounce or whatever, now you're getting 5, 10, 15 years? Or are they judges that's going to look at you and, and try to help you like but we can vote on stuff like that and people were thinking just November 3rd but I think the way they change policing is reallocating and now instead of just you can protest but you also go up to your city council meetings and find out what this chief's about let me see his background how is he hired let me go to southeast division let me see what that captain's about let me see that that sergeant about we have the right to do that so that you know who your elected officials are in your county, your state, and how they see police work. I think people just think, oh, the change, of course, unless they fund them, unless they elect Biden. No, yeah. it starts at the ground, grassroots. And I think people forget, like, we got midterms, you got different elections that happen before November 3rd that no one takes part in. And then you have a, and then, and I'm not saying LAPD, but then you might have a police chief that gets into power and that thinks, this law enforcement, this, this law and order, and people are complaining about it, and it's like, it's not fair. Do you know about him? Do you know you can go and you can Google him? How did he get elected? Get him out of the office. You can do that too. So it, it's, um, sometimes I think it's like a disease, and I don't know where the, I don't know where the cure is, 
But they haven't even tried to develop a vaccine for it yet. LAPD, you know, it's worth noting that had a lot of attention drawn to it in the in the early 90s for yeah. violence. And so yeah. they were actually under scrutiny in a unique way that the rest of you know many other cities weren't. And so I was just checking on, we were asking a second ago about police shootings. There it was like 115 in 1990, and there were 26 last year. You know, right. so it's coming down there, but that's because of the scrutiny. And I think that scrutiny doesn't exist. It didn't exist in Minneapolis or in Ferguson or, you know, all, all these, these places where these things are happening. And so some of it is public scrutiny because when people realize that they're being watched carefully, they change their behavior. But I think some of defund the police and part of the reason I, I don't talk, I don't love the slogan is because I don't think it does justice. They're talking about reallocating. Terrible slogan. Yeah. They're talking about reallocating the funds to people who specialize. Okay. A, tra a traffic you know, police officer who deals with that mental health, uh, actual violent crimes, um, you know, homeless, homelessness, um, domestic violence, you know, specializing people. So I think it's a misleading name. And I've heard a lot of people make arguments for it that that just is what it is. We're, it's, we're defunding the military side of the militaristic side of the police and reallocating the funds. But I kind of wish there was a catchier way to say that. And I, Agreed. Sly, I'll just ask you how you met and got involved in Officer Lynn's program. Uh, shoot, we did the, we did the, uh, we were doing the Wednesday night talks with Sput, and then I had just, um, all that crazy stuff was happening, but I don't know. I reflected on my experience, which is the opposite growing up in the suburbs of, um, of Texas, you know, but, um, and kind of just thinking about like my insecurities and what held me back, like as a child, as a black man, like trying to grow up in this country, whatever. And um, and I don't know. I just feel like I got to the root of it because I'm like sitting here in Mexico. I'm just like, well, dang, what am I gonna do? I'm like, yo, I need to talk to these kids, and like the kids are the kids are where it's at. It's like forget the adults. It's like you can sort out your own emotional scars, like you're grown. But like the kids, like that's the opportunity I feel like to really influence the change. Um, and just even something as simple as like thinking like when I was a child and somebody said to me like, I was like, I want to be president of the United States. I was six years old. And they're like, you can't be president. You're black. Teacher didn't say anything. Teacher didn't step in and say, that's wrong. You can't say that. It was just, that's what it was. And, um, you know, thinking about kids that got the chance to be born like with, with under Obama, whether or not you believe in the structure and the government and how effective the president actually is like um anyways <laughs> all that to say uh so i decided to start working with kids on tuesdays and uh i was talking with keith a lot about it because i knew that he had experience with that but um it was really it was really informative and and uh he just kind of was i was like hey you want to join us and he's like yeah sure and then we kind of became partners in this whole thing and and um and you put on a virtual festival right yeah, we did like a virtual music festival just for like the kids in in this school, school district. Yeah, Nikki, you were there. Yep. Carl, we gotta get you on the next one, man. That'd be awesome. All right, all right, I'm down. But, but um, they they just did a uh, yeah, it was cool. They it was just kind of getting them excited to go back to school because I mean, who wants to go to virtual school? I I wouldn't yeah. go to virtual school. It sounds terrible. Yeah, like we're adults and like. <laughs> It's it's like a, a task to like turn on the computer and be like, okay, we're gonna do this thing, you know. So I can only imagine for kids what that's like, and a lot of them are not even paying attention because they're in their own bedrooms. Like I I taught a music I taught a music camp a virtual music camp, and there was this one kid he was laying down, you know. And we're like, yo, you gotta get up. Because, like, we know you're in your house and we know you're in your room. You know? <laughs> like, are you playing a video game right now? There was one kid playing a video game, like, while we're trying to teach him. And he has on the headset and everything. And we can see him with the remote. We're like, Michael, put the remote down. You know, <laughs> like, we're trying to tell you about the scale. Like, what's happening? You know? And, yeah, it's that's tough. And especially when kids don't have resources you yeah. know these are kids with resources you know and they were like just in no man's land 
So having kids that like don't really have anything and they're just sitting there staring at the screen, I don't know. I, I really want to get to the bottom of this, like um, um, as far as figuring out how to <coughs> how to get everybody to, to vote and pay attention this next you know few years because this this police thing is crazy and and um and i tell you the most startling thing that i realized during this trump era is i always thought that there were more black people in this country than there are you know we, we only present we only represent 13 percent like 13 14 percent of the population so we are really dependent on on white people figuring it out. You start looking at the policing and, and looking at the, the, the irrational fear that we evoke. You know, it's kind of like um, 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 Doc Rivers was saying, you know, like everybody's, you know, the, the, the Republicans are giving everybody this scare tactic. Like we're the ones to be scared of, but we're the ones that are being, being killed. Yeah. You know, like we're, um, we're we're definitely more in that you know that Dave Chappelle like you know scared of the young white guy you yeah. know for 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 the real reasons just like what what's going on in in Michigan right now with these freaking guys getting ready to, to kidnap that's, the governor you know? that is crazy but we but but that said you know back to the the policing thing like we just you know I I, I wanna I wanna I agree with you, Keith, on the, um, you know, as far as the voting and really like, I'm going to take a look at who my, my police chief is and who um, the guys are under him and, you know, and actually start reaching out to city hall and finding out what's being done on this level, because it it really is the important part. I mean, I just want to figure out how to get this irrational fear out of everybody so we're not, you know, like the fact that you <laughs> are worried about how fast you can let them know that you're an ex-police officer. You know, for those of us who think sometimes, you know, because we're fairly articulate, you know, you, you, but, but that shouldn't really be oh, the, criteria. that shouldn't be the criteria, you know, yeah. like we shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to prove your intelligence to be treated fairly. And that's, and that's part of what goes on too, you know, like, I'm I'm able to usually talk my way out of a, out of any of you know a police encounter because I'm you know I'm not doing any dirt and I you know and I'm I'm quick on my feet with that but that shouldn't be the the the, the criteria for somebody not getting shot. Yeah, and absolutely. So, so I'm definitely going to take your your advice on that and 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 find out who works for me in my city and start trying to trying to reach out because my, my sister's been telling me to do that for years. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take you guys up on it and, and get involved in the local politics more. Dude, I would, I would say Carl, that it's happening. I would say that the more that I speak with people, um, the more, you know, more aware that people become of the situation, it's happening. My friends are researching who's in their city council, mm -hmm. you know, like we are, <clears throat> we're, we're seeing who's, who's on the ballot, who those people are. I mean, like, I've never watched a, a city council meeting. I started watching city council meetings and like taking note of mm -hmm. who, who represents me in my district and how they're voting, you know, because that is extremely important. It really and is. I definitely saw something that I did not like. And I was like, okay, this is this is exactly what they're talking about. This uh -huh. is exactly what's happening because those people represent us, the people that you know uh, live in the district that you live in. Those people represent you, right. and the way that they're voting is not a representation of the people that live in the district. You know, like they're giving, you know, more money to the cops so that they can surveil and, you know, have drone programs. You know, and I'm like, honestly, it's not necessary. The the neighborhood that I live in, we don't have crime. We don't have crime like that. Like, yes, it's a, it's a you know, there's poor people that live around here, but they're not. There's no crime. You right. know, there's not there's not a lot. And it's like that that is unnecessary. SWAT gear more more of this uh you know 
bills or every year. Like they, I watch them. I mm. watch them pass a bill to give uh, the APD uh, about seven hundred thousand dollars for that. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, okay, this is <laughs> this is exactly what everyone's talking about. Mm-hmm. So I'm taking that extremely, you know, I'm taking it very seriously. And I'm researching who's up because it's, ha- it, you know, the election's happening right now. You right. know, your, um, your DA, you know, and, and also uh, district judges, the district court judges. Like, right. that's, that's a big one, especially here. I mean, I live in Texas, you know, so... There's uh the the school superintendent, that's big, you know. Those are the people that decide like what's happening in the schools, and we're always complaining about how our kids are not getting the education that they need or the materials that they need or what they deserve, teacher salaries, like all of those things, you know. So, as um the professor said in 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 the uh, last episode, the first episode, he said, you know, a democracy only works if we're involved. You know, it doesn't work if we don't if we don't use our voices, if we don't, you know, um, give our opinions of what we think should happen. So it is on us. It's on us. And and I believe that, you know, it obviously there's a lot wrong with the system, you know, but if we're talking about 50 percent of the population voting, it's like you're only going to get half of the needs met. You know, so it, it is on us and I'm I'm very excited about what's happening because we are talking about this actively every single week, you know, and I think that because we are more and more people are becoming aware and more and more people are doing research and more and more people are finding out what they can do. So this is all it's all been terrible. There have been absolute horrible horrific events that have happened but unfortunately for us as humans it always takes something extreme you know for us to then take action it's like oh we got to get a root canal and then we'll start flossing you know what i'm saying (laughs) and it's like it's completely preventative you know so honestly i'm like okay i i got it now i got it i i'm part of the guilty party i got it now and I'm going to keep spreading that and speaking that and being like, all right, this is what we need to do. You know, if we have the power. We are the people. We have the power. You know, and they try and make us feel like we don't, but we do. Yeah. So we need to take it and, and do something with it. Well, thank you so much, Officer Linton, for joining us here. Uh We'll throw the website up there. It's boys to gentlemen.org. That's boys, the number two gentlemen.org. You can learn more about that. You can donate on there. It's definitely a good cause. And you're donate people. Yeah. Donate. <laughs> you got five, ten dollars. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> Goes a long way. For real. Yeah, Thank you, officer. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Good to see you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right. Good All right. See you later. Thank you. All right. Oh.